years ago, Unity Baptist Church was established. Now, it had it actually obtained the name Unity Baptist 32 years ago. It was a merger of two churches, Emmanuel and Grace. And, uh, but 1983 is when it took on the, cha- uh, the name of Unity. And we'll be celebrating all those years here in this town on next Sunday. Now, here's what we do on homecoming. Service is normal on Sunday morning. Well, I don't know how normal service ever is, is it? Um, and then uh, we'll eat afterwards, dinner on the grounds. And so what we usually do is whoever comes, make enough food for your family and then some because we'll have some visitors, all right? Now, if you have visitors come, don't make them cook, all right? Just tell them to come on unless they're really good at cooking, and then it'll be okay. Uh, but we'll have our our eating afterwards and good fellowship and then instead of having an evening service because look a lot of these ladies that cook I know they start on Saturday and they're wore out and so we'll have an afternoon service right around 1 30 okay after we eat and fellowship some we'll come back in here it may be a little later than 1 30 but I know if I don't set some kind of time it'll just linger and linger and people start going home and all so we'll have a service in the afternoon and then you'll be dismissed for the rest of the day but I, I hope that you'll come next week, all right? If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. And if you love how the ladies around here cook, say amen. amen. I think that might have been louder. That's not good. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 35. And if you're visiting this morning, we are honored to have you here. I know there are a lot of churches in this area. And for you to come and visit us, we sure do uh, take that seriously. And we are very honored to have you here. Luke chapter 7, verses 18 and 35. We'll be talking about belief and doubts this morning, or faith and doubts. Look in Luke 7, 18 through 35. If you would stand, please. If you're able to, if you're not able to, don't worry about it. We're going to read the Word of God here. You follow along with me as I begin in verse 18. And the disciples of John showed uh, showed him of all these things. And John, calling unto unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were coming to him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Verse 21. And in that same hour he was cured, uh, and in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? What went ye out for to see? A a man clothed in, in, (coughs) in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. Verse 30. And the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, Whereunto shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are likened to children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath the devil." The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Father, 
we need you this morning. We've gathered here, and Lord, we enjoy the singing. We enjoy the fellowship and caring for our brothers and sisters. What an opportunity, Lord, to have church family. Lord, now is this time that we gather around your word. And Lord, would you help us in obedience to yield to your word this morning. And Lord, draw us closer to you and conform us more to the image of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You know, you, you look as you read the Bible, these disciples, they had seen all kinds of stuff, hadn't they? They had seen uh, the deaf receive their hearing. They had seen the blind receive their sight. They had seen the dead raised to life. And, and yet, in spite of this, we find these disciples displaying doubt and lack of faith over and over again. Sometimes Jesus would say to them, almost in desperation, Oh, ye of little faith. How long am I going to be with you? The man with the possessed, uh, the son that was possessed of a devil showed that same kind of doubt or lack of faith. In Mark chapter 9, verse 24, he goes to Jesus and says, Look, I've been to everybody else. I went to your disciples. Nobody can heal my son. He is possessed with devils. They throw him in the fire. They throw him in the water trying to kill him. And, oh, is there anything you can do? Can you heal my son? And he said, Well, if you believe. And that man's answer, boy, I'm glad the Lord put this in Scripture. That man looked at the Lord. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. In, in mixed in with that belief was a little bit of doubt. In this passion, or passage, we find even John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Savior, to have some doubt. We find here maybe his fate wavering just a little. And yet, we, and we see of John, as the Lord says in verse 28 here, I say unto you among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. He that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Here's John the Baptist, this great man of God, this fearless prophet and preacher of the truth of God. He was arrested. At this point, he was imprisoned. His life is in danger. He was arrested, arrested by Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. Herod had illegally taken his brother's wife to be his own wife. And as a result of that, as one day John is standing before Herod, John tells him, what you've done is wrong. What you have done is a sin. Here this prophet stands before the, 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 the ruler of that area there, this man who has the power of death and life in his hands concerning John the Baptist, the man who has the, the power to let him go free or keep him in prison, and yet John boldly proclaims the truth of the gospel. And, and may I say to us Christians, there is nothing wrong with speaking the truth. But it ought to be spoken in love. And I don't know that uh, 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 John spoke this out of dislike or hatred for anything but sin and a love for John. Look, when someone's doing something wrong, the best of friends is the one who will gut it up and go to them knowing this isn't going to make them happy, but I care too much about them to just let it go on. I've got to talk to them. I've got to wave some red flags. I need to express some danger here. And to go to that person and put our arms around them and say, listen, I love you, and I pray for you. Now, don't say it if you don't. But you, you love them and you, you pray for them and say, listen, I'm concerned about something. I don't, I, I'm not coming to you as an authority, but as a friend, I love you. And look, this is wrong and I'm concerned about the direction you're headed and I wanted to ask is there anything I can do for you is there anything I can do to help you in this area you're my friend we are brothers in the Lord we are sisters in the Lord we are family is there anything I can do for you and to boldly declare the truth listen child of God there is nothing wrong with telling the truth to unbelievers. 
that Jesus is the only way to heaven. As a matter of fact, that's one of the greatest demonstrations of the love of God is to take the gospel, the cure, the the answer for their longings and their needs, to take that to a lost world. But preacher, they don't want to hear it. But it is such an act of love to say, look, in spite of the fact that no matter how I say it, they're not going to like it. I've got to because of my love for Christ and the love Christ has given me for lost people I don't even know. I must tell them. So John, he fearlessly speaks out in Luke chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. We see this by Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Now we see in verses 18 through 23, John's questions. John begins to have a little doubt. You ever been there? You ever been there where your, your faith wavers a little? I mean, it's not that you entered into unbelief, it just wavered some, like that man with the sick son. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, there's been many times where I go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I believe you can deal with this situation. I, I just don't know that you will. Or, Lord, I believe that you have something in store for me. I'm just scared of what it is. Charles Spurgeon said this, I think when a man says, I never doubt, it is quite time for us to doubt him. It is quite time for us to begin to say, Ah, oh, poor soul, I'm afraid you are not on the road at all. For if you were, you would see so many things in yourself and so much glory in Christ more than you deserve that you would be so ashamed of yourself as even to say, It's too good to be true. Charles Spurgeon was saying sometimes that doubt is because we see our sinfulness in contrast to the holiness of God and to think that that God could love a wretch like me. That seems too good to be true. One said this, some of us who have preached the word for years and have been the means of working faith in others and of establishing them in the knowledge of the fundamental doctrines of the Bible have nevertheless been the subjects of the most fearful and violent doubts as to the truth of the very gospel we have preached. You know who said that? Once again, Charles Spurgeon. The, this, the one that was called the Prince of Preachers. The one who shook continents. God used to shake continents for Christ. And even he said, sometimes we succumb to doubts. Listen, folks, the devil uses some things to try to get us off track. Even if he can get us off track one degree, one of those things is doubt. And what a good definition of doubt is, is simply questioning the Word of God. Not why is that there, but boy, is that really true. God, I know you said you would supply all my needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus, but will you really? Lord, I know you said you would be with me always, but, but are you really? Lord, I, I know you said you would be my strength and my God, and Lord, I know you said you wouldn't put more. You ever, I've prayed this for Lord, I know you said... Uh, you wouldn't put more on us than we could carry. Well, I just want you to know I'm getting awfully close here. I don't know if I can carry much more. There's discouragement. Discouragement, you know what it does? It makes you look at your problems rather than looking at your God. Sometimes there's diversion the devil uses. It makes the, the wrong things seem attractive so you'll want them more than the right things. Sometimes he uses defeat he uses that to make you feel like a failure so that you don't even try. Sometimes he uses delay, makes you put off something, put off doing something so that it never gets done. But one of the chief things here is that doubt, that questioning the Word of God. 
wondering, is it really going to work out the way God said? And we see John here, the Baptist, the one who he said, there's never been anybody born of woman greater than John the Baptist. And now he's in prison and he tells his, his disciples, his followers, look, go ask him. I've been preaching about the one that is to come. I was there. I baptized him. I saw that Holy Spirit descending like a dove on him. I heard the voice of God. This is my beloved son right here. I heard all that, but that was a few years ago, and my mind's kind of cloudy, and now I'm in prison. Go ask him, is he really the one? Is he the one we've been looking for, or or do we need to look for another? John was asking for confirmation of what he had believed and preached. In verse 19, we read that, And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? He had been preaching of the coming one. He believes that Jesus is indeed the one. Now he's in prison. His life is in danger. He asked for confirmation. You know, we say sometimes, and have you ever heard this? Well, you should never question God. I've heard people say that. I've heard people say that. To me. Now, I know, preacher, we're not supposed to question God. I don't know that you can present a strong case for that in the Scriptures. And we find many Old Testament and New Testament individuals here questioning, wondering, It doesn't necessarily make it a right thing, but it is a human thing. We are clothed in fallible flesh and bone. We have this sinful sinfulness about us. Once again, that man with that son, Lord, I do believe you. Help thou mine unbelief. We see John's doubt in verse number 19. Look, or I just read that where he sent those disciples. He said, are you really the one that should come or do we need to be looking for another? Now, I want you to notice something John did with his doubt. He didn't allow it to linger. He faced it head on. He didn't just sit there in jail and say, Oh, I wonder. I wonder. Boy, I sure hope. I wonder. He said, You know what? I've got to nip this in the bud. I'm not going to live in doubt. Now, look. You may, as a child of God, experience doubt from time to time, but do not allow yourself to be held in constant captivity by doubt. Do not allow it to linger. So what does John do? He can't go to Jesus, so he gets a couple of his followers, his disciples he had been teaching, and said, hey, listen, you go ask him and come back and tell me. Go ask him, are you the one we've been looking for, or do we look for another person? Notice that when the disciples asked John, or Jesus that, they said, listen, John Baptist has sent us He wants to know something. He's in prison. He's in fear of his life. He wants to know something. Are you really the one? He he told some of uh, Jesus' disciples had been former disciples of John. And John had told them, look, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the earth. There he is, fellas. The one I've been preaching about. Look, there he is. Some of them went and followed Jesus. Now some of those following John, he said, listen, he, he believes you're the one, but are you really? He didn't, and and the Savior didn't rebuke him. He could have. He could have said, I I can't believe John doesn't believe. But he didn't do that. You know what he does? He displayed his authority and his deity. Look at verse 22. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the, de- the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. He said, listen, go tell them what you've seen. You've seen me heal the deaf. You've seen me fee- feed the poor. You've seen me raise the dead. You've seen me heal the lepers. You've seen me cast out demons. Go and tell him the things that he- you have seen here. Tell him not to stumble at it. That don't stumble. He said, blessed are they, uh, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. He was saying there, tell him, John, don't stumble at this. John, you're on the right road. You, you, you've got it here, man. 
Don't falter now in 1 Corinthians 1 23. The Bible says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greek foolishness. He said, John, you've got a little doubt here. And I just want you to know, you want to know, am I the one? Well, John, listen to all that's going on. This is confirmation right here that your doubts are unfounded. It, you believe rightly. John, don't stumble at this now. Don't fall over this now. Don't depart from your faith now. Don't release it now. John, I know you're in prison. It, your life is in danger. But don't throw in the towel now. John, hold on even though you don't understand fully. One person said this, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is a matter of the mind. We cannot understand what God is doing or why He is doing it. Sometimes something will come into our life, whether it's a, a physical condition or a financial setback or, or a, a, a relationship troubles, and we will wonder, well, why is God allowing this to happen? And we say, I oh, know I'm not supposed to question Him. Listen, that doubt is a thing of the mind. And, and when we get saved, how many in here saved? You trust that Christ is your Savior? Okay, now, you put your hands down. Let me ask this. How many of you are perfect? You've reached perfection? Anybody? No? Just, just Danny. And uh, we knew he had raised his hand. Amen. <clears throat> if that is perfection, y'all, we're doing great, okay? <clears throat> Doubt is a matter of the mind. We cannot understand what God is doing or why he's doing it. Unbelief is a matter of the will. We refuse to believe God's word and obey what he tells us to do. There's a difference there. A, a, a doubt is when something's come in our life and we say, well, I just don't understand this. And in our frailty, in our weakness, we wonder why. I don't know how your home operates, so I'll tell you in my home. And my home is not always the right way, I'm sure. But I allow my boys to question me sometimes, as long as it's respectful and sincere. Sometimes if I tell them to do something or ask them to do something, I usually ask them, and I'll say, could you do this for me? They have liberty with me to say, now why, Dad? And if it's that why, I, I want to, why do we do what we do here. Well, you know what? I like, I welcome that question. Man, that's a teaching opportunity. Now, if it says, well, why should I do it? Oh, because Brad's giving me something to whoop you with now. But, Dad, why do we do this? Dad, I know in our home, other people do this, but we don't do this. Why do we not do this? I welcome that question. It's a teaching time. Folks, listen. It is not sin when something comes into your life that you just don't understand. But you really want to understand. And it's not a sinful thing to say, God, why is this? No, 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 no. Well, now, God, why should I go to church? God, why should I read the Bible? Why should I pray? Why should I live holy? No, not that, Lord. Why? Lord, why, why is this loved one of mine sick? Is there something you're trying to teach me? Is there something you're preparing us for? Lord, why am I going through this, this storm right now? Lord, this is tough. Please tell me there's a reason. I don't want it to be in vain. Lord, I know you, you try us by fire and use the fire to get the impurities out of us. And, and I know Job said that he'll come forth as gold when he comes out on the other side of this. Lord, I just need to know, are you refining me? Are you using this to strengthen me? Are you using this to draw me closer to you? John, or Jesus then, after he tells those disciples to go back and tell John those things, and look what Jesus does here. Now, right after the people hear this and they know, wow, even John the Baptist has some doubts here, Jesus begins to praise John. 
verses 24 through 30, we see, number one, that he says, oh, let's read it right here. Uh, verse 24. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken in the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in raiment? All they which live gorgeously are apparelled um, and live delicately are in king's course. He said, who would you go out to see? Some wishy-washy guy? John was a strong man. And he fearlessly preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And look, the Pharisees didn't like it. The lawyers didn't like it. The Sadducees didn't like it. Herod's wife didn't like it. <clears throat> but he continued to fearlessly preach. He didn't tell his disciples, look, I want you to go out and take a poll. See how popular my message is right now. See what it is they like and don't like. Maybe I need to flip-flop on something here. Maybe I need to change it up some. What? I only have a 2% approval of the Pharisees? Well, I need to uh, uh, change my message a little bit to gain some more approval. No, he didn't do that. He was out for one person's approval and one only, and that was God. And he says, John was a prophet. Man, he was bold to speak the word of God. Now, even in this time of doubt... We see that John, look, even when he's doubting, he stands firm in his faith. Faith, folks, always has a little doubt mixed in with it. In verse 24, what went she out for? I just read those verses. Saying what a, what a prophet he was. We see he's the forerunner. Look in verse number 27. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before me. That prepare, he meant that John had come to furnish or, or to prepare or, or to equip or to make ready. In Luke 1, 15 through 17, we see this prophecy of John the Baptist. It says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to, to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In verse 28 it said, For I say unto you, and this back in verse uh, chapter 7, for I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. He says, look, this was this one that you just heard. He, he sent somebody to ask him, am I really the one? He's a prophet. He was the one prophesying the old scriptures to come before me and to preach me about me and to prepare my way. He said, among those born of women, there's nobody greater than this man. So look, when you experience doubt, you're going through a storm. And there's one coming if you're not in one now. You're going through a storm. I think of Brother Steve over here. Last Sunday night, his brother was killed. Man, that's a storm right there. And I'm sure there's from time to time, God, why did this happen? Why did it have to happen like this? And when you go through that and you get those questions in your mind of, God, I don't understand why. Lord, I, I, I'm just not sure how this is going to end. I know you say all things work together, but it's hard for me to see that now. Listen, I want you to rest assured of this one thing. You're in good company. Because we read of saint after saint after saint in the scripture who had those times in their life. But here's something else they had in common with the doubt. Is that in the doubt they didn't quit. They did not release their faith. They held on tightly to it. We see the people's response to John. Verse number 29. Let's look there in verse 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. The people identified with John. There, here was a man clothed in, in camel's skin. 
<clears throat> here's a man that was eating wild locusts and honey, and yet the masses were attracted to this. What we would look if we would see him the day out at Walmart, walking around in camel skin, asking people, say, "Hey, where's the the grocery section? I'm looking for some wild locusts." looking for some grasshoppers and some honey to eat, we would say, whoa, that's a strange one over there. But it wasn't that way with John. The masses went out to him, possibly by the thousands. They were attracted to him for some reason. Then Jesus comes along. He's quite the opposite. He's in the town. He's eating with the publicans and sinners. He doesn't come across quite maybe as brash as John did. He's dressed like they are. He's eating the food they are. But now we see the masses attracted to Christ. What was the commonality here of John and Jesus? It wasn't their methodology. They were very different individuals. What was it? Listen now. It was the message. It was their genuineness. The Pharisees rejected John's teaching. We see that over and over. Luke 13, 34. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. John displayed some doubt, but the Pharisees displayed disbelief. There's a difference there. That remember that disbelief, it's a thing of the will. Well, I, I refuse to believe and act on and obey what the Word of God says. That doubt is not that, Lord, I don't understand, but I'm going to obey anyways. We see in verses 31 through 35, Jesus' uh, uh, criticism of the Pharisees. We see that they wouldn't respond. While the publicans and sinners are going out to John and being baptized and turning uh, in repentance, turning from what they did believe to the Savior that John was preaching, the Pharisees stood there and they said, Hey, we've got it made. We're the lawyers. We're the Pharisees. Man, we're the righteous ones. We don't need what you're saying. He compared them to little children playing their flutes. He said, in the mar you're like little children in the marketplace that are playing their flutes and they're dancing along and, and then you'll, you'll mourn and you'll dance along. You're all joining together. But John wouldn't play your games. John wouldn't march in lockstep with you. John wouldn't go along with their way of doing things. God, John followed God above even the religious leaders of that day. The Pharisees, they wouldn't repent. They said John had a devil. Again, and that man's crazy living out in the wilderness dressed like that, eating that stuff with that brash message of his. He has a devil. Jesus comes along. He's quite different. And now they say, well, he's a wine-bibber and a glutton. They called him a friend of publicans and sinners. Look, as I said a moment ago, the problem was not in the methodology of John or Jesus. The problem was in the heart of the Pharisees. What matters is, is the truth being preached. One person said this, people who want to avoid the truth about themselves can always find something in the preacher to criticize. This is one way they justify themselves. But God's wisdom is not frustrated by the arguments of the wise and prudent. It is demonstrated in the changed lives of those who believe this is how true wisdom is justified. They said that John was too strict and that Jesus was too nice. But the evidence of the truth was seen in the lives that the truth changed. Listen. Give me this one right here. Don't focus so much on the messenger. Focus on the message. But it, I know we're human and we can get wrapped up in personality and how people do things, methodology. And we can say, well, I like that preacher. I, I know when I first came here, goodness, I'd go knocking on doors and I'd knock on, hey, I'm the new preacher down there at Unity Baptist. Oh, you're the funny guy. 
you're the funny preacher not the brother Warren not the you're not the the guy who uh, exegetes the word of God so well you're not the man with the power of God but you're the funny preacher We'll say, well, I, I like that guy because he's funny. I like that guy because he's lively. I like that guy because he's a little more calm. I like that guy because he, he runs around. I like that guy because he stays still. I like that guy because he, 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 whatever. Look, it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. Let me ask you something, folks. Why is it that every time a Christian, how many of you in here still slip up and sin? Anybody? Okay. Just a few that don't. And I'm going to shake your hands and see if some of that rubs off on me. Why is it that when we see somebody with a big name that's a Christian mess up, we don't give them the same mercy and grace that we desire, but we join in with this world to crucify them? Why? Why? Man, a lost man can do it, and we'll say, oh, bless their hearts. We, we need to get them the gospel. And we do. That. you know why? They need the grace of God. But a Christian doesn't. Well, they should have known better. Wait a minute. You just messed up. The only difference between you and them is you didn't get caught. And instead of when somebody messes up, and yes, uh, surely there may be some penalties that they have to uh, 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 endure. There may be some punishment they have to endure. And boy, the shame of it. If they're a public figure, the shame of it is a big thing. Finish this with me. Herein shall men know that you are my disciples if you have love for who? One another. And yet somebody publicly messes up and instead of saying, now, what they did was wrong. But for the, if, if it weren't for the grace of God, my wrong could be publicized. They're repentant. They're sorry for what they did. Hey, we need to love them and help them and, and, and help them carry that burden instead of saying with the world, yeah, stone them. Oh, wicked. Can't believe it. Bunch of liars. When just that day before, somebody called your house and you told your child, tell them I'm not home. Why do we shoot our own people? I, I don't know if sometimes it's our pride. It makes us feel good about ourselves. Sometimes I've even known of Christians to hope other Christians fall. To hope other preachers mess up so that they can say see my way is the right way no look there's only one right way folks that's Jesus Christ alright and I don't want you ever walking away from here saying well we do this because pastor says look pastor is a boneheaded idiot sometimes <gasps> you shouldn't say that hey, just speaking the truth in love you follow me only as I follow Christ. Man, the things I say behind this pulpit, we call it the sacred desk here because there's a sacred message being preached. Not a sacred person preaching a sacred message, though. Listen, inspect it all by the Word of God. Let me ask you this as we conclude here. Where is it in your life you struggle with doubt? Lord, why does I have to be this way? Why am I going through this? Why do I have to carry that burden? Where is it you struggle with doubt? One preacher that struggled with a lot of doubt said this, Continue with double earnest to serve your Lord when no visible result is before you. Any simpleton can follow the narrow path in the light Faith's rare wisdom enables us to march on in the dark with infallible accuracy since she places her hand in that of her great God. That's our Savior. Child of God, out, let me, let me. your preacher does too. There's times... Or man, the devil rides my back. And I, I don't even know if it's the devil. It just might be my own flesh. 
I think, Lord, I just don't know about this. Lord, am, am I doing this right? Lord, is this really supposed to be meant to work out for my good? As we struggle with our doubts, we can't see sometime where we're going. It all seems dark around us. In faith, we can sure we'll end up on the right path, even in the dark times, when we continue to hold the, the hand of the one who guides us. So you may doubt, but don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't let go. Just keep serving him. Let's pray. Father, we need you. Oh, my goodness, we need you.